Sudi, how are you? Chris? <laughs> Good morning, Family Church. How are we doing this morning? How are we doing this morning? Yes. So highly favored. I'm here in highly favored. I love it. We are blessed, highly favored, and we're so glad to be in the presence of God this morning. And guys, I just want you to worship this morning to the King of Majesty. Amen. Amen. To know you so much more, more than I have before. These words are from my heart. These words are not made up. I will live for you. I am devoted to you, King of Majesty. I have one desire just to be with you my lord just to be with you my lord jesus you are the savior of my soul and forever and ever i'll give my praises to you
He took my sin and he buried it.
and I am unfulfilled without full communion. You are the light. You are the light. Song of my life. You always lead me. You are the voice inside. You are my love. No one before you. All that I am points to you. And I was made.
our minds, Heavenly Father. We surrender fully to you. We surrender to you, God. We give it all to you, Heavenly Father. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm away. Lord, have your way. Lord, have your way. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm away.
nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else will do.
give you the glory. Church, let me ask you to open your mouth, open your heart, open your spirit. Let's talk to our Father. Let's give him praise and glory and honor and majesty. Thank him for the week that was and commit the next week to God. What a beautiful thing to be in his presence. What a joy to be in his presence this morning. Let's worship the Lord. Let's give him the praise for he deserves it all. Pour yourself, pour your heart to God every time you come to this place. Just pour yourself to God. Don't go back home as you came. Fellowship with your father. Get to love him. Get to know him better. Get closer to him. Pour yourself completely to God. Blessed Master, we give you the glory. We give you the honor. We love you, Lord. You're worthy to be praised. You're worthy to be glorified. We love you, Master. There is no other God like you. There is no other Father like you. Ribasha ka kasta la baba ha ka kasta la babu buzandaba. Lord, we bless your name. Lord, we exalt you this morning. You're worthy to be magnified. You're worthy to be exalted, O God. You're worthy to be lifted up on high. Your holy majesty, what is your name, O God? Great is your faithfulness, O God. There is no other God like you. We bless you, Master. We love you, O King. Thank you for keeping us alive. Thank you for keeping us in good shape. Thank you for perfect health. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the blood on the cross that translated us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of your marvelous light. Thank you for your stripes, by your stripes you are healed. Thank you for the redemption. Thank you, dear God, for the gift of our families. Thank you, your majesty. You are so, so good to us. You are so close to us. You are a good, good, good Father. Blessed be your name, O God. Holy is your name. Thank you, Master. Amen. Father, we thank you as a church for the very gift of life. We thank you for keeping us in good health. We thank you for enabling us to be in your house this morning. And our Lord, I thank you for these, your dear children who love you. These children you purchased by your precious blood. Father God, I speak your favor in their situations in the name of Jesus. I speak your breakthrough in their families in the name of Jesus. I speak peace of mind and peace of heart to everyone who came in this service. As they go home, let them feel refreshed, revived. Let them feel your sweet presence. May your joy be their strength in the name of Jesus. Every difficult situation, we lay it at your feet. Lighten up our burdens, O oh God. Take over our finances, Jehovah God. Bless the work of our hands. Be the Lord of our families. We commit our children to you, O oh God. We pronounce your blessings upon them. We speak your protection upon them. We speak your favor upon them. In the name of Jesus, how we love you, Lord. We thank you for this country where we live. 
There are many people who are living in war-torn nations. There are people who live in difficult situations. We thank you for the privilege to be in a place with peace. How we love you, Master. We give you the praise, O oh God. We thank you for family, church. You have given us a place where we learn your word, where we are taught your word, where we are getting closer and closer to Jesus. Lord, I thank you for everyone who is a member of this congregation. We pray that we may grow together as a family, leaving no man, leaving no woman behind. As we hear your word today, may your word have some resting ground in our hearts. May your word cause life to our situations in the name of Jesus. And as we give part of what you've given us, O Lord, would you please accept our offering? May it be pleasant unto you. Blessed be your name. Thank you, Master. In Jesus' name we pray. And God's children say, Amen and Amen and Amen. Let's turn just for a few moments and profess our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Let's start just for a few moments. We have a 2023 20, confession. Now, I want to see some oomph. Can you put some oomph? We say it from the bottom of our hearts. If you can, this is like our pledge for 2023. You're speaking this to yourself. Say it like you mean it. Want to go. I am loved by God. I am blessed. I am highly favored. I am healthy. I am happy. I am good looking. I am in great shape. I am secure. I am motivated. I am positive, I am valuable, I am needed, I am determined, I am purposeful, I am successful, I am prosperous, I am victorious, I am an achiever, I am empowered, I am loving, I am peaceful, I am forgiving, I am patient, I am kind, I am generous, I am well able as Jesus is in glory. So I am here on earth. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Can we just give a hand to the praise and worship team? <laughs> Thank you so much, team. You're doing such a phenomenal job. Aren't they doing a good job? Yeah. They are doing such a phenomenal job. And uh, kids, your teacher is waiting for you at the back. And uh, we have a young man, one of my sons, by the name Alex. Alex, can you wave? That young man graduated with a master's in, is it cybersecurity? I think we deserve to appreciate him. Yeah. I would want us to have that culture of celebrating our own. Alex, you made us proud. We honor you. We salute you. As we give to the Lord, if in case you're new, you're visiting us for the very first time, we prefer giving the Rukasha Penzel. And you can write a check, Katase Family Church. But in case you have cash, we still can collect it. And let me encourage you with one thought. Every time you give to the Lord, you are essentially telling God you trust him to bless you. You trust him with part of what he has given you. In fact, giving 
is literally an expression of trust. The opposite is also true. When we don't give, we are basically telling God we can manage our finances, we can manage our lives, we don't need your blessings, uh, we can work it out. We have it figured out. Every time you don't give, you're telling God, I mean, I have figured it out, I can manage uh, to handle life and finances without you. Well, it's good to see you again, and uh, once more, good morning, church. Please help me appreciate your neighbor. Tell them you're looking good. <laughs> yeah. Aren't they looking good? Yeah, they're looking good. You know, the people who say yes the loudest are the ones who look the best. When you're looking so good, you're able to compliment others. If you joined this service and you're following us on YouTube, or Facebook, we welcome you. We are so excited you joined us. And in case you find yourself in the Atlanta metro, please welcome here at 287 Mount Calvary Road, Marietta, Georgia. We meet from 10 to 11.30 every Sunday. 287 Mount Calvary Road, Marietta, Georgia. Every Sunday, 10 to 11.30, you'll find us here. Today I have an exciting sermon, why many marriages don't work, a life-changing sermon, a sermon that will save you from a lot of pain, why many marriages don't work. Let me begin by saying about 50% of married couples in the U.S. file for divorce, and I'm sharing the latest data from divorce.com. I know we have statistics from many sources, and this is a recent one, just last month. Further, these data suggest while 50% of first marriages fail, 60% of second marriages fail. And sometimes people end up marrying the third time, and 73% of that marriages fail. This implies you have a higher chance of succeeding in your first marriage. But again, the bigger question is, why would someone fail in their second and in their third marriage? I think it's because many people leave the marriage blaming their partner. They never introspect. They never cross-examine. So they carry forward the same baggage to subsequent relationships. And of course they get the same results. I have the privilege of people booking me to speak to them every week, at least four couples from different corners of this world. I take them through counseling through Zoom. And 100% of the time, couples who book for counseling are always blaming their partner. So I keep wondering who then broke the marriage. Everybody is blaming the other person. So when we don't learn the lesson, we repeat the same mistakes because we are the same people getting to another relationship. Father, majority of couples going through their first divorce are around the age of 30, plus or minus 5. But that's the time most people end up divorcing. Married couples between the ages of 20 and 25 are 60% likely to get a divorce. We are talking about the first divorce. 20 to 25 years of age, they have a higher chance of divorcing than any other age in marriage. Actually, I have done two contrasting videos. I've done one video on seven advantages of marrying young, and I've done another one, seven biggest regrets of marrying young. You could check them not in the service. After service, you can check them out. There are pros and cons. But I know a lot of young people, 20 to 25, do not even know what they are getting into. I'm not against marrying young. I married when I was 25. But a lot of them do not even know what they are getting into. And that's why the highest divorce rate is 20 to 25. Actually, divorce is highest the first two years. And the second highest period when people divorce 
is year five to year eight of their marriage. The first two years, we have the highest divorce rate. A lot of people don't stay the course. The slightest hit, they throw in the towel. And the second highest time when people divorce is between year five and year eight of marriage. Let me, let me make a disclaimer here. No marriage is beyond breaking point. There is no time you can say now, we are beyond divorce. Nobody graduates matters marriage. We have to continuously work on our marriage. Now, as a result of divorce more than anything else, 86% of single families in the U.S. are led by mothers. This is data from Statista gathered between 2014 and 2019. That means among the single families, 14% are led by fathers, 86% by mothers. In other words, when marriages end up breaking, it is mothers who are left with the burden 86% of the time. It's mothers who are left with the burden of raising children single-handedly. A lot of fathers walk away without caring. And 57% of millennials are single moms. And let me also suggest very few people plan to be single moms. Of course, we have people who became single moms because they lost their partner. We have single moms because they were never married. They simply got kids out of wedlock. But majority of single moms, they had either a boyfriend or a husband, and the relationship did not work. They never wanted to be single moms. Life happened. Stuff happened, and they ended up raising kids, the entire burden on their shoulder. Let's face it. Each one of us here this morning is a product of a father and a mother. Each one of us here had a father and a mother. Whether your parents lived together or not, it's a different story altogether. But one thing is a fact. You had a father and a mother. I refuse to believe it's God's perfect will for a father and a mother to live separately. I believe with all, with every fiber of my being, the perfect will of God is for a man and a woman to live together peacefully and raise their children together. I am so passionate, matters family, and that's why we named this church, Family Church. This is my calling. If I, I can teach on this subject about family the whole year nonstop, and those of you who follow me on YouTube, you know for sure, every week I release at least three videos on relationships. And uh, this is something a lot of pastors are very uncomfortable. It's not, a very, it's not an area of comfort to keep talking about relationships. Like many other people would rather talk about success and motivation and deep doctrines like eschatology. But I will tell you this. The number one pain point on this planet is relationships. The number two pain point on this planet is money. If you want to reduce your stress levels, take care of your relationships and your job, your work, your business. Basically, if you take care of your relationships and your finances, you will have taken care of more than 95% of the things that stress people. And that's why a lot of people who try to discourage us from talking about money and relationships, I just ignore because this is where it pains the most. And uh, last year, I released a book dubbed Marriage Works. And this year, I released another book dubbed Sex and marriage counseling. As I told you, this is one of my prime areas of passion. And uh, these books are available in Amazon. If you have someone you love and you wish them so well in their marriage, you might want to give them a Valentine gift. This is a good time to help them work on their relationships. This morning, ladies and gentlemen, I want us to think through three critical reasons why many marriages don't work. There may be more reasons. I'll just pull out three. Why many, many marriages do not work. Number one reason why most many marriages fail, sorry. Why many, many marriages fail. Wrong foundation. 
wrong foundation. As a matter of fact, a lot of us think we know how to handle relationships. And so we go ahead and build marriages our own way. And of course, they end up failing. The Bible says in Psalms 127.1, Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Marriage is God's idea. Every time a man and a woman think they know how to build their marriage, the Bible says they labor in vain. All their efforts to build their house is in vain. Because marriage was not our idea. It was God's idea. You might ask me, Pastor, what is building a house with the right foundation? Jesus answered that question in Matthew 7, 24. The one who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is the wise man who built his house on the rock. The one who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice puts them into practice, is the woman who built her house on the rock. So building on the right foundation is building on what God says about marriage. And this morning, I want us to reflect on three foundational stones for marriage. The first foundational stone for marriage is trust. Trust is the first rock, the first building block upon which marriage is built. Without trust, you have no marriage. Scripture says in 1 Corinthians 13, 7, love trusts always. If you don't trust your partner, definitely you have no relationship. In fact, the number one cause for divorce is infidelity. Sexual infidelity is the number one. Number two is financial infidelity. Number three is abuse in marriage. And number four cause of divorce is poor communication. The leading cause of divorce in marriages. If you really do not want your marriage to end up in divorce, if you're listening to me, whether you're in your first marriage or your second marriage or your third marriage, it doesn't matter. The, th the fact remains, if your partner stops trusting you, that marriage will end up breaking. And the question I ask myself, why is it that sometimes we don't trust our partners? Where did the trust go? The number one reason why people don't trust each other is sex before marriage. I know you hear this from me all the time. You are almost tired. If the Lord takes me home and leaves you behind, I want you to keep telling people, Pastor kept on warning us about this. And I'll keep repeating it because sex has become very casual. There is no culture. There is not a region. There is no region on this planet where we had casual sex as we do it these days. Check your culture. People waited until they got married to be intimate. This is the first culture. These last 15 years or so, with the explosion of social media, our morality has sunk a new low. And this is the deal. Every time you sleep with someone before wedlock, you have sent a message to them. You believe in casual sex. You believe in sex before marriage. Even if you get married to these people, they are always suspicious about your behavior when they are not with you. And that's why you're always monitoring each other and trying even to hire investigators to check and put in some apps in your partner's phones because you don't trust them. You know they can do monkey business because they did with you. A lot of marriages are breaking simply because we have a wrong foundation. And in any case, if a man slept with two, three, four girls, and a woman slept with some five men before they got married, you get into that marriage bed, you are ten people. If you slept with four people, your partner slept with five, that's nine, and your partner, you are ten people. That's not me, that's the word of God. First Corinthians 6, 16. It says when you sleep with someone, you become one body with them. So you're already ten people in one bed, quarreling. And what I mean, what is the genesis of your stress as a couple? And if you slept with someone who took you to Venus, and you get married to this dude who is unable to reach the clouds, 
You had a dude who took you beyond cloud nine. You come into marriage expecting this guy is going to take you that same place in your intimacy. So from the first day, you are comparing him with your best experience before marriage. And so for you to enjoy your intimate moments, you have to keep on recollecting your memory. You have to keep on pulling that memory of that past experience. So you're with your partner, but in your head, you're sleeping with someone else. Otherwise, you won't come. Hey, this is church. Let's get back to church. So the Bible says, flee sexual immorality. Flee fornication. 1 Corinthians 6, 18. The moment you get involved in sex before wedlock or any sex outside marriage, you have cracked your marriage trust. And trust is almost never recovered. You can work and work, but it's never regained. You may be forgiven, but trust is never regained. The second foundational stone is wisdom. And wisdom has many facets. But basically, I'm talking about emotional intelligence, not IQ. I'm talking about EQ, your ability to control your emotions. Whether you are excited or angry, whether you are happy or sad, how do you control your emotions? The Bible says in Proverbs 12, 6, 16, fools show their anger at once, but the prudent, the wise, overlook an insult. Fools show their annoyance, their anger at once. But the wise overlook an offense. They overlook an insult. So fools will slap their partner immediately or throw a hot pan to them or call them names of all domestic animals because they don't know how to control their emotions. No marriage can survive continued assault by one party, it will eventually give in. And what surprises me is people who are dating, they notice these characteristics in the person they are dating, and then they still hope this character will change and I'll marry them. This is foolish. People date someone who is an alcoholic, someone with anger problems, someone you're even suspicious their family is rooted in witchcraft. And you hope somehow I'm going to reform this person. You, are, you cannot be a psychiatrist to your marriage partner because you're the cause of their stress in the first place. There is conflict of interest. You cannot be the one rescuing them from yourself. You do not qualify to rescue your partner from emotional breakdown. And that's why dating is time for data collection. It's not time for getting involved emotionally. Because when you get involved emotionally, you compromise logics. You ignore the red flags. That means you should have space for breaking a relationship when you're dating. A lot of us, when we are dating, we imagine we are married. You are dating primarily to collect information, to gather data whether you should go ahead with marriage or not. But the moment you start sleeping with them, it's as good as marriage. The moment you sleep with someone, you become one flesh with them. And so you cannot see them in their true colors. That's why they say bli uh, love blights. It's not love. It's lust that blights. If you come collecting data with an open book, that the reason I'm going for coffee date with this person is to get to find out whether we can live together. Then you know there is space to stop a relationship if your values do not converge. And the third foundational rock is salvation. Now, a lot of Christians these days ignore this fact. When I was growing up, this was unthinkable. There was no debate. Everyone in church knew you have to, the first thing you look for is someone who is born again. Today, parents are emphasizing college degrees more than salvation, more than values, more than morality. Education is more important. That's why kids can't miss school, but they can miss church or Bible study or a prayer meeting. 
Our priorities are wrong. Yet, if you think about it, while education is important, and I'm a strong advocate for education, you don't need to overpreach it. It's almost obvious they will go to school. What you need to preach more to your children are these timeless values. People write to me all the time, Pastor, are you saying I can't marry a Muslim, a Buddhist, a Hindu, an atheist, an agnostic? Hear me clear. Yes! That's what I'm saying. Why not? Not me. The Bible. Let's read 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 16. Let's read what the Lord says. We are talking about foundations. And if you're not going to follow the Lord's instructions, you have a bad foundation. You have a weak foundation. You will come back to me firefighting for marriage counseling. I guarantee you on that. Listen at what the Bible says, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 16. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Say this after me, please, each one of you. Say this after me. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. I said after, not with me. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Now listen to this. Deuteronomy 22.10, God said, Do not plow an ox and a donkey yoked together. Why? They are animals of a different species. Deuteronomy 22.10. Do not plow with an ox and a donkey yoked together. Now I want you to follow this. Because God is saying, animals of different species cannot be in harmony. They will go fighting. You are stressing the animals. Now verse 14 again. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? One has to live, either the light or the darkness. The two cannot coexist. Verse 15. What harmony? How do you expect peace in a family? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Belial is Satan. What harmony is there between Christ and Satan? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? You're accusing your pastor? This is Pastor Paul talking. Anointed of the Holy Spirit. What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What is Paul saying? You don't share values. You don't read from the same script. You're animals of a different species. One is heavenry. You will live in different planets forever unless that person comes to Christ. Verse 16. What agreement, what contract? Marriage is a contract. No, marriage is a covenant. That's a, something deeper than an agreement. What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Amazing. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, Our bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit. But in this scripture, it says we ourselves are the temple of the living God. And that unbeliever is a temple of idols. How is it that the church today, people really don't care whether, about somebody's faith? It's, Jesus said the children of this world are more shrewd than the children of light. Why? Go to the Muslim world and they will tell you they marry Muslims. Hindus marry Hindus. The church is confused. It's us who don't care about somebody's faith. And the Bible tells us we have no argument with those who don't believe in Christ. If you do that, you're doing it at your own peril. You're building your own house. If you want the Lord to build your, own, to build your house, it has to be based on trust. That house has to be based on wisdom. And that has to do with your control of emotions. That's the application of the knowledge you know. And number three, it has to be premised on salvation. Those are the non-negotiables. The second reason why many marriages fail, and by the way, I'm saying this because it is the Christian world where a lot of divorces are taking place. Ironically, the highest divorce rate is in the Christian world simply because we don't even have Christian marriages and Christian families. We are Christian by label, but we don't practice Christianity. We don't practice scriptures. We don't follow the instructions of our master the Lord Jesus Christ, our role model. The second reason why marriages are failing these days is lack of leadership. 
lack of leadership. Now, God instituted the marriage to be headed by a man, to be led by a man. The moment you start leading your family, I guarantee you one out of one, it will fail. Not it might, it will fail. Marriage is not our idea. Marriage was not invented by Hollywood. Marriage is God's idea. And the leader of a family is the man, not the boss, the team leader. These are partners with a team leader. Now, it's amazing that we all know the success or failure of a country depends on the leadership, not the resources. Every country has resources. How much a country succeeds depends on the leadership. If you look at Israel, just an example, no oil to date, no seagull, natural resource to date, and a very tiny size of land. They are the fourth strongest military power. They don't have the resources in the DRC or in South Africa or in South Sudan. Meantime, South Sudanese have been there. They live in abject poverty. A place like Emirates, they have only one natural resource, which is oil, total desert. Good leadership, everyone there is doing well. Every one of them, Kuwait, Bahrain, Oman, Saudi Arabia, all the citizens are doing well. Leadership. So we know that the buck stops with the leader. And that's why we replace leaders. In every country, the buck stops with the leader. In every company, the buck stops with the CEO. And in the church of Jesus Christ, Jesus himself said, the buck stops with me. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of heads shall not prevail against it. I'm responsible for my church. My church will never fail. I'm responsible for my bride, Ecclesia, for my wife, Christ is saying. And he's telling men, follow my example. Follow my example and lead your family. The Bible says in Genesis 2.24, or rather God said, immediately after creating Eve, taking her out of the side of Adam, he said these words, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Leave to cleave, and they shall be one flesh. What is leadership in family? Let me pull out three leadership blocks, leadership pillars in family. The first one is provision. A man must provide to his family. Now, let me first talk to those of us who are singles or dating or intending to get married. If a man cannot buy you dinner when you meet, you have no business in him the second night. Trust me on this. A man must provide. It is God who said. Look at what, what God said. Therefore, a man will leave his father and his mother to be joined to his wife. Before he can get a wife, let him leave the mother's house and get his own apartment. Let him start providing. If he's still in his mother's house, you have no business continuing the dates. Girls these days are dating guys who are living with their parents. What a shame. For you to know he's ready to date you, he should have left his father and mother and started living on his own. The Bible says he who does not provide to his family is worse than a non-believer. First Timothy 5.8. Worse, in other words, what I told you on foundation of marriage is salvation. You would rather be with a heathen who is providing than a believer who cannot provide. That's what that scripture is saying. He who does not provide to his family is worse than an unbeliever. You cannot enjoy the privileges of a husband without the responsibilities of a husband. The first duty of a man is to provide. We call our heavenly father, father. Father means what? Provider, provision. We live at a time when women sometimes are earning more than men. I mean, the odds are fairly equal for a man and a woman to earn these days. So we have many women who are making more money than men. That's not a problem. The problem is when the man is not providing at all. If, for example, a woman is so blessed, she earns 10000 a month, 
and the husband is earning $5,000 a month. That's okay. I mean, God has blessed us differently. What I'm against is that the guy is watching TV, expecting the wife to pay mortgage and rent and buy food and then fix dinner, drop children to school. That's not a marriage. That's a farce. That's a fake. And it won't even last. There is a saying in my mother tongue. I'm going to translate it. Please, for those of us who are not Kenyans, I promise you, I'm going to translate it. This is how we say it in Kenya. Mwanaume ni effort. Translation, a man makes effort. He tries. Even if your wife is providing, you're showing effort. I'm doing something. We live at a time when in this country, state after state after state, women are calling me because men are fake. They have fake projects pretending to provide. Unfortunately, you can't hide in marriage. Marriage will flush you out. Marriage will expose you. You can fake with your friends out there. You cannot fake it in marriage. It won't take six months before your wife realizes you are fake. And that marriage will fail. The second pillar in terms of leadership in marriage is protection. A man must protect his wife. The Bible says, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother. Must live to cleave. Without living, you cannot be one with your wife. And we are still in a time when mother-in-law is competing with the wife. Hear me, gentlemen, if you're following me on Facebook or YouTube. Once you get married, you transfer your mother from your nuclear family to your extended family. That's what you chose. That's what you signed for. We must get our priorities right. Once you get married as a man, God first. Number two, your wife. Number three, your children. Number four, parents both sides. Number five, siblings both sides. Now... I know this is hard for many of you because we put our children before our partner. It is still wrong. We must come back to the foundation that God instituted. Number one, God. Number two, your partner. You even ought to protect your partner from your own children. Meaning, don't argue with your partner in the presence of your children. Your partner comes number two after God. Your mother must never compete with your partner. That does not mean we disrespect our parents. No. We must honor our parents. But we must do it in a manner, it doesn't have to be either all. It can be a win-win situation. Because we are in agreement how we want to support our parents. So what we did with Mercy, we dealt with this question before we got married. So for her dad and her mom, every time we want to send them a gift, Easter gift, Christmas gift, I'm the one who sets her parents' money. She's the one who sets my parents' money. That sorts it out. We communicate a strong message to parents both sides. They cannot come between us. That umbilical cord between men and their mothers must be cut for them to cleave to their wife. If you're still a mama's boy, you will never create your marriage. And number three, Initiative. Leadership means taking initiative. Taking the lead. Piloting. That means if you're single and you're listening to me as a girl, never ever propose to a man. That's tragic when the hunter becomes the hunted. If a man cannot get a car safely out of the car park, what makes you believe and trust them to drive you safely along the interstates? If you propose to a man as a woman, even if you get married to that guy, you will continually drug him throughout your marriage. And if you continually drug a man, he will drag you to a pit. He will pull you down to a pit. I warn you, if you're a single lady, do not propose to a man. If a cheetah was chasing an antelope or a gazelle or a deer, and suddenly the deer stops and faces the cheetah head on, for a few moments, the predator will get confused. It's again his nature. For the hunter to become the hunted. We are living at a time when women are proposing. Why is this wrong? Because 
If a man cannot propose, he's not able to lead you. He may be a good man, but not for you. A man must lead, must pilot, must be on the steering wheel. He should be the one asking you, when are we buying the house or building one? or renting, whatever. He's the one who should be telling you, where are we taking our children to school? And drop them the first day. Taking initiative. He should be the one leading you to church. We live at a time when it's women leading men to church. When it's women coming up with values for the family. When it's women doing homework with children. When it's women who know whether they are buying a house or not. When it's women who know what's going to be eaten there. What a shame. There will never be a marriage until men get back to the steering wheel. We want titles. We are the leader. Without taking the responsibility for leadership. Show me one company that works when the CEO doesn't take the leadership. One country that works when the president or the prime minister or the king, whatever title they use in that system, does not take the lead. Why is it only in marriage the bug doesn't stop somewhere? I suggest to you this morning, the back stops with the man. How can I say that? Jesus said it. I will build my marriage. And I will never blame any devil. Matthew 16, 18. The back stops with me. I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I am responsible for my church, for my bride, for my marriage. We will continue having divorce until men take the leadership. Not the position. Your gender does not make you a leader. Taking responsibilities make you a leader. And number three, why marriages fail. Poor communication. There is so much to talk about communication. I actually want to focus on this item this coming Sunday. You see, we are in February. Today is 5th of February. And I want to take advantage of this love month to talk love matters. Is that okay with you guys? Because this is a critical area of our lives. So this coming Sunday, I will talk about communication in marriage. I will delve into serious details. I've had the privilege of training at least 100 corporate organizations matters communication here and abroad. And what I'm going to teach you will work not just in your marriage, but also in your corporate world. So for today, I want to pull some advice from Brother James, chapter 1, verse 19. My dear brothers and sisters, so this is not for men, this is for both men and women. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. So one more time, and the last time, I'll ask you to say something today so that it is sinks in your system. I want you to make a pledge to yourself. So please, 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 say these words to, after me. After me, please, say these words. I will be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Can I suggest to you this morning, this is the manifestation of wisdom. If you want to know whether you're wise, I'm not talking about book knowledge. That's your IQ. I'm talking about EQ, the management of emotions. Remember, anger is not sin. Even God gets angry. But the Bible says, in your anger, do not sin. And do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Anger is a natural human emotion. To, to deny anger is to deny our humanity. But if you say a wrong word when you're angry, then you have sinned. If you hit your partner because you're angry, you've crossed the line to sin. If you refuse to talk to your partner because you're angry and you're upset, it's okay for a few minutes. You're human. It's okay for a few hours. But if tomorrow you're still not talking to them, you are sinning. So the Bible warns, in your anger do not sin. Do not give a foothold, a window. A loophole for the enemy to destroy your marriage. So look at it this way. Slow to anger. That's where we are. How do we become slow to anger? We have to be slow to speak and then quick to listen. If you don't want to get angry quickly, speak slowly. 
but listen a lot. A lot of people listen to reply. They listen with an answer. They actually don't listen. Most people don't listen. They hear what they want to hear. But when you're quick to listen, you don't just hear what they are saying, but you hear what they are not saying. Let me repeat that. When you listen, you don't just hear what your partner is saying, but you hear what they are not saying. You hear what they are not complaining about. When you listen, you send a message, I care. I care about your feelings. When you don't listen, you're simply saying, I don't give a damn. Go to hell. That's the way they speak in America. I don't care. That's what you're saying. When you listen, you're sending a message, I care about your feelings. I empathize. I can put myself in your shoes. I feel you. Empathy is to put yourself in the other person's shoes. To listen from their perspective, from their worldview, from their frame of reference. That's the message you're sending. I care. When you listen, you are saying, I want to hear your views. Your views are important to me. I value your opinion. Have you ever realized this? Everything you say, you already know. You know. Unless you're sick or mad. When you open your mouth to speak, what you're saying, you already know. You begin to learn when you listen. Now you're learning. Now you're learning. I am not. There is no statement I'm making accidentally. I've gone through this message I have prepared before coming to church. So everything I'm telling you, I already know. I begin to learn when I sit down and you give me feedback. So you begin to learn your partner when you listen. Otherwise, you work with assumptions. And assumptions are the termites of relationships. That's what destroys relationships. Emotional intelligence is management of our emotions, which means if you graduate or you get married on your wedding night or your graduation day, birthday day, you get too excited. You go on a nightclub, you climb tables, you lift up your legs to the ceiling, you are lacking EQ, emotional intelligence. You can't manage your excitement. The converse is also true. You get angry, you call people names, you hit them, you run away from home, you drive crazy, you cause an accident, you're lacking wisdom. You may be educated, but an educated fool. Wisdom is your ability to manage your emotions. Emotional intelligence is what we call wisdom. Knowledge will be seen in your IQ. You might ask me a question, Pastor. Well, tell me. I have already messed up with my marriage. Is it too late? What can I do if I had a wrong foundation? Is there hope for me? Yes, there is hope for you. First, remember this. The only reason people cannot make their ways is because they are not willing to learn and they are full of pride. If you are willing to learn, and the only re reason you can't listen is pride, massaging your ego. When you are humble, you can listen to the other person. So what do we do if we have already messed up with our marriage? I suggest today, get a journal and write down your marriage goals. You will never hit a target that you do not have. And if you're single, you've never married, have clear goals before you get married. And I'll suggest three of them. So if you're wondering whether we can revive your, your marriage can be revived, get to know this. It's never too late with God. God told Ezekiel to prophesy to the dry bones. It's never, ever too late with God. If you have not yet left that marriage, give it a chance. The reason why marriages don't work is because people have given up. They have thrown in the towel. If you have not yet thrown in the towel, give it a chance. Any marriage can work. Trust me, you're going to leave your husband for another guy who was left by someone else. What makes you think the guy who was left by someone else is better than the one you have? Why do you always think this is a deception from the enemy of imagining all leftovers are always better than what you have? Number one, rebuild on the right foundation. I'm talking to the ones who have not yet left. I'm going to talk to the ones who have left. Rebuild on the right foundation. What's that? The word of God and prayer. I've done this. This coming month, we will be 20 years married. We've done this with Marseille every day of our lives. So as the kids grew bigger, 
they joined us in reading the Bible every day and praying together every day. Trust me on this. If you can get back to reading scriptures together as a couple and pray, trust me on this. God is going to build your house. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. T try it. I've told you many times. I'll repeat over and over again. Only God can build your marriage. The secret is God. At least I know this. I would pray. This would be my wish. That every couple on this planet can have the kind of a marriage I enjoy with mercy. I'm not saying you do things our way. We are all different. But I would pray and wish every couple on this planet. They enjoy each other. They have the fun. They respect each other. They love each other the way we do with my mercy. I tell you this from the bottom of my heart. That would be my prayer. And I'm saying this, get back to the Bible and prayer. Number two, take your responsibilities seriously. It's not going to work if you ignore your responsibilities as a man to provide. Begin to provide to your family. Pay for those vacations. You don't have to do it like me. You don't have to go every week out like me and Mercy. But you can go out every month. What gets scheduled gets done. Without your phones, just connecting with each other. You can surprise your partner with clothes. Gentlemen, every month we may never have enough clothes for whatever reason. You can buy an outfit at any given moment. It will be appreciated. And ladies, you can buy your husband a watch, a belt, a jacket, a shirt, inner wears. He'll appreciate once in a while. Protect each other from any third party interference, including your own parents. Don't allow your partner to compete with your parents. Agree how best to honor your parents, how best to support your parents without giving them a chance to terrorize your partner. People interfere with your marriage to the latitude you permit them. And number three, to rebuild your marriage foundation, communication. I said we are going to delve into deeper waters next week on communication. For now, let me suggest this. Learn to take dinner together every night. We take dinner together every night as a family. Why do that? It creates time to talk together. Quality time together to listen to each other. So you're creating time and you're talking with each other, listening to each other. It's the same reason why I still drop Zeke to school, even though he can drive himself to school. To listen to him in the morning, to listen to him in the evening, to connect with him, to hear his stories on a day-to-day -day basis. Because we have to be intentional to spend time with each other. Learn to listen, to empathize with your partner, to say thank you. I conclude with 1 Peter 4, 8. Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. Listen at the apostle again. Continue to show deep love for each other. What is to show? Your thoughts don't bless me. I need to hear you love me. Do things that show you love me. What is he saying? Gentlemen, tell your wife I love you every day. Send that text. This is the person you should be sending emojis, not your work colleagues. You should be formal with your work colleagues. But with your partner, you can throw all those emojis you like. Learn to say thank you for every dinner. Thank you for every intimate moment. Thank you for the outing. Spend money for your holidays. I'm serious on this. Why is it that you want to reward everyone? You're paying the power, you're paying for water, you're paying everyone else, except yourselves. Why do so many Africans feel so much pain to pay for a sea cruise, to pay for a holiday? Jehovah help you guys. What are you keeping this money for? Can I tell you? You will leave every coin here. Why go through this life without enjoying anything? On the lower side, I have to do one annual vacation with my kids. I have to do one, one, one uh, anniversary vacation with Mercy alone. And I have to do a Christmas vacation 
with my kids out of town, out of state, usually sometimes out of the country. Learn to do this. Invest in your relationships. Lady, learn to tell your husband, you are handsome. I like you. I'm privileged to be married to you. You're my best. I'm happy. I'm glad that you're my hubby. Let's talk to each other. Let's surprise each other with gifts. Let's manifest love. Let's show love. Love cannot just be kept as a secret. Love has to be expressed, manifested, show love for each other. This is what Peter is saying as a way of concluding. Did you receive the word? Did you learn anything? Did you learn anything? Can I request you to take just one minute or so and ask the Lord, what were you telling me today? Which area do I need to work on? Whether I'm single, whether I'm dating, whether I'm married, whether I intend to get married, I've gone through divorce. There must be something God spoke to you. Maybe if you've gone through a divorce, there's something God is telling you to avoid the same mistake tomorrow so that you don't repeat the same mistake. Just have a moment and just reflect. What is the Lord telling you today? Let me say this. I trust God right now to bless each one of you with a wonderful marriage, whether you are married or not, whether you are divorced. It doesn't matter what you've gone through. People can judge you, but God gives us a second chance and a third chance. Trust me on this. God is a God of a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance. As pastors, as people, we can pull all the doctrines, we can pull all the verses to condemn you. People condemn you because of their own sins. Do you remember the woman who was brought to Jesus? And they said we caught her in the act of adultery. Why did they do that? Because they were adulterers themselves. So Jesus said, whoever among you doesn't have a sin, pick the first rock. They were embarrassed. They were ashamed. And they all left. Every time you see people throwing stones at you, it's because of their own issues. They're just hypocrites. Masking. They have messed up so much. If you see somebody throwing stones at you because you messed with your marriage, believe me on this, they are very messy. Only that maybe they have never been caught. The righteous cover for each other. Trust me on this. Joseph tried to cover up for Mary. He realized Mary is pregnant. And he didn't want to expose her. The Bible says... Because he was a righteous man, he wanted to leave her nicely. He knew, now this lady has gotten pregnant. I have to figure out how to release her without exposing her. That's what righteous people do. Love covers a multitude of sins. Where there is love, we cover for each other. Where there is hypocrisy, we want to expose each other. God doesn't expose us. Anybody who is trying to expose you is a hypocrite. Ignore them. God will give you a second chance and a third chance and a tenth chance. Hypocrites will never give you a chance and they should not bother you. So I want you to trust God. Everyone listening to me, young and old, for a good marriage. Irrespective of which stage you are in your life. Whether your marriage is not working, whether you've gone through divorce, whether you are dating, whether you are single and not seeing anyone. I want all of us to trust God. For a good marriage. Because he's a God of a second chance. He forgets our sins. That's what the Bible says. And your sins, I will remember them no more. And he covers our shame. Love covers a multitude of sins. Many things we have done. Love, love, the name of love is God. First John 4, 8. God is love and love is God. Love covers. God covers a multitude of sins. He covers my shame. He covers your shame. He doesn't come. To expose us. God doesn't come. He is love. His name is love. He comes to cover us and to give us another chance. So don't worry that somebody has written you off or someone has refused to give you a second chance because of a certain theology. When God comes, he gives you another chance and he covers our shame. He comes to heal us, to bandage our wood, not to expose us. Are you with me? Father, in Jesus' name, I bless you for this, your children. Some of us have gone through divorce. And Lord God, you cover our shame. 
I'm praying, dear God, that you may heal our wounds. They are so deep. We were hurt by someone so deep. I'm praying, dear God, everyone who has gone through divorce, and they are still hurting. May your healing flow through their hearts, O oh God. May they sense the warmth of your love. May they sense healing from above in the name of Jesus. May you prepare them for a second chance. Under that chance. For you are a God of a second chance. You are a God of a third chance. Father God, I thank you for those who are married and they have given up on their marriage. There is no hope in this marriage. It looks like the valley of dry bones. I prophesy the life of God in their dryness. In the name of Jesus. I speak the life of God in this marriage. Revive that which looks like dead. Resuscitate that which looks dry. For you are the life-giving God. In the name of Jesus. Father God, I thank you for those who are single. And they are dating. Guide them, Lord, into the right values. May you build their houses. May their houses be built on the right foundation. And those who are single and they are not dating. I pray the right life partner will locate them. A man and a woman who loves you, Lord. A man and a woman who fears your name will locate this, your children, in the name of Jesus. You know their name. You know their address. You know where they are located. You know their desire. And you answer the desires of our hearts. This year, we are going to hear wedding bells in this church in the name of Jesus. I prophesy wedding bells in the name of Jesus. Almighty God, I thank you. And I bless your name. We also celebrate you for the marriages that are working. God, we don't take any credit. We give all glory and all honor to you who've been building our homes. Thank you, Master. We give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And God's children say it. Amen. amen and amen and amen. Can I have your hands? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord bless you and turn his face toward you. The Lord bless you and be gracious to you. The Lord protect you and your loved ones. The Lord promote you. The Lord be with you and make your work successful. In Jesus' name, amen. Shalom. So much for joining us. You can go ahead if you're in the area. We would love to have you at 287 Mount Calvary Road, Marietta, Georgia. That's 287 Mount Calvary Road, Marietta, Georgia. And don't forget to drop your comments down below. We greatly appreciate them.